everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith. This is the rules overview video for U-Boat, the board game, currently on Kickstarter. The very first thing I want to make mention of is the solo aspect. There's been a lot of people asking about this, and I want to let you guys know and reassure you that the solo play of U-Boat, the board game, has been built into the game from the ground up. It was actually established inside the game in the early developmental stages. It wasn't just tacked on just for the heck of it. So, and essentially, when this says it's a one to four player game, Game. Yes, the solo player would be controlling all four of the major uh, individuals or roles, so the engineer, the first officer, the navigator, and the captain. What I've heard on the Kickstarter page and on BGG, as well as in the comments on the Kickstarter, is that the designers are looking into ways to potentially mitigate some of the um, actions and some, not necessarily the actions, I guess the better way to say it is to mitigate some of the work required to manage the four different roles in solo play. How that's going to pan out in the end, I cannot speak to. So if what I'm doing in this prototype is showing you essentially how things are moving with everything being controlled by me, which is a lot. Um, but at the same time, I believe if you were to if you were to start playing this game, and of course you were like any game, enjoy it and play it a couple times through, you're going to catch on to those rules very quickly and realize exactly which individual role needs to do a specific task, and it won't take it'll be second nature very quickly. Uh, it will only be a massive bonus for all of us if they happen to add into the app the ability to basically take control of some of the mechanisms from these individuals if you're playing solo. If that's the case, that'll be a fantastic addition. Uh, they may speak to that during the Kickstarter or they may already have so make sure that you're keeping your eyes on the Kickstarter and, and make sure to ask those questions because I'm sure that they would be willing to answer those. Uh, so we're going to go through the rules right now. So the very first thing I want to make mention of in the rule book essentially is it talks about uh, basically controlling, you know, one individual role. Well, typically in solo play, we've got all four. So that means we're not going to be following the rule where you're only allowed to only touch your own character or your own uh, color of miniatures. So normally the first officer could only touch and control and activate the four black uh, crew members on the sub. But because I'm playing solo, I have access to all of them. So that rule doesn't apply. Um, and of course, in terms of care using other figures to help other people out uh, you can do that normally when you're playing more than four players so of course you can do that when you're playing solo play so let's take a moment to talk about the sailors themselves. So players move their sailors around the submarine to carry out orders. So of course, if you're controlling the captain, you have access on the first watch to the chief and these two sailors right here. So again, these four individuals are represented on the sub. We know this from even the setup video itself. Each player is going to control two watches of four sailors each, or in solo play, everybody. Uh, and then, of course, the sailors are represented by plastic miniatures, which we talked about that correspond to the bases and colors. The cruise tiles are double-sided, and each side represents either the first or the second watch. For the first watch, beginning of the game, the crew tiles are placed and the player panels just like this. So basically, these player panels will be on the bottom section of the board. As soon as the second watch takes over at the sound of a ding or a bell inside of the app, then basically this gets flipped over. Of course, I've got some tokens here in the way, but basically it'll sit right here. And of course, it'll line right up with these top activation tokens up here. So you'll notice that when this particular crew tile gets placed down, that they're divided up right here so that the lines kind of line up perfectly. And so that there's three activation spots per crew member, uh, regardless of whichever role you're assuming. So let's talk a little bit about specializations in crews. So basically this crew, for instance, of the captain has the, the captain himself, the chief, and two sailors. You'll see specialization icons that are beside each one of them. Some are the same, some are different. So sailors, for instance, have two of the exact same specializations. They are do similar things. Chief's a little different, and captain, of course, is very different. Uh, these different ones have all kinds of different meanings, and we'll talk about those as we go through the gameplay. But for now, I'll just let you know the ones you're seeing here in front of you. So essentially, these are reloading of the tubes. Uh, within the actual U-boat or submarine themselves. This is going to be flooding and firing torpedoes. So these are specialization that this, uh, these two sailors have. This guy can essentially have specialization in reloading the tubes. Uh, the captain, of course, has specialization in the periscope as well as the hydrophone. So these are all things that can be used uh, by these individuals. We'll talk about what that actually means and why they're specializations and how that affects gameplay very, very soon. Next up, we'll talk quickly about the navigator. I'm not going to go through every single one, but the navigator, for instance, has, um, of course, it's more about observing. So there's going to be binocular uh, uh, 
specializations going across the board here. These all have to do with observing. So there's four different observing uh, specializations. And then of course, right here, we've got meal preparation. Uh, right here, we've got the 20 millimeter cannon. Two, two individuals or two of the observ uh, observers can actually have a specialization in this. And then this one right here, is the sextant. And uh, so we got all of those together making up that particular watch. Now, when the watch changes after six hours and this thing flips over to the opposite side, you notice something changes. So you'll notice that the first officer doesn't do exactly what the prior navigator did. So his his actual specializations change. So for instance, if there's carryover, we'll have to talk about that in the future as well. If there's carryover from crew to crew after the watch changes, um, that can affect gameplay as well, but you can see these guys do still have the binoculars, so they're still going to be observing, uh, but you can see other specializations have been mixed and matched in there a little differently than the first watch. So something to be aware of. All right, let's cover some basic gameplay elements, mobilization and orders. So essentially, as you can see, even on the captain uh, player reference card right here, he's got a whole slew of orders that he can do. Now the very top left one says crew mobilization. You wanna think of crew mobilization as being kind of a specialty uh, order that can be done. Essentially, when you go ahead and spend one point on the order track by moving this particular token up one space on the Roman numeral track here, this is called an order track. Once you do this, you're basically the captain's giving orders to everybody in the crew, everyone that's on the ship to have a free mobilization. And that uh, enables the players to move all their sailors around the U-boat or in solo mode really allows you free will to move sailors around as you see fit. Uh, the captain obviously has to advance the order track by one space for each mobilization and has to do that prior to uh, the individuals moving their sailors. So this has to be moved to this position before people start going crazy and moving all their stuff around the sub. Now, you do not activate the sailors who are mobilizing. So in other words, you're not gonna go ahead and put an activation token of the sailor that you moved and go, oh yeah, I activate him. No, 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 the captain actually issued an order and forced everyone to move around on the sub. So you keep those activation tokens to yourself because you're gonna need them later uh, when you go ahead and activate uh, for other reasons. Uh, any number of sailors can be moved during a single mobilization. So again, free reign on that one. Sailors can move from any number of starting sections to any number of destination sections, which are connected by an unbroken chain of adjacent sections. So of course, if you run into a flooded section, that's gonna break that chain. So you can run through the sub fairly easily, but as soon as something floods uh, and stuff like that, you've got a break in the chain. You can't obviously pass through. Now, just so that we're all aware, of course, the control room, which rests right in the center of the sub, is considered adjacent to the bridge, which is up on top. So in other words, players that are down here can easily jump up into the bridge area on a mobilization and will be doing so, especially for the observers and navigator, to get up top to take a look outside the sub when they're surfaced. Orders can never be issued or carried out during mobilization. Only after mobilization is finished can orders be issued and carried out again. Now mobilization allows the chief engineer to reposition his toolboxes. Now this is a really handy thing. Any sailor moving from uh, from or through a section containing a toolbox might may take it with him and place it in the section where he finishes his movement. So for instance, as of right now, we know the two toolboxes rest in the officer's quarters and the bow section. So if we happen to move anybody from either of those two spaces, we could pick that toolbox up and move it to another area. This becomes really handy when things start going south. Very quickly, the captain can issue an order um, and then that order to do a crew mobilization by of course increasing this on the order track uh, will then allow a crew member to go ahead and grab that toolbox and move it to a different part of the ship bearing in mind if any flooded sections are there you're not gonna be able to get that uh, toolbox to the right side of the ship if the flood sits dead center in the middle and you need it over here you're kind of hooped because you've got that thing cut off you got to deal with it all right the next thing I want to talk about is like hazardous sections. So a section becomes hazardous when there's a fire, toxic gas, electrical failure token placed on it. We talked about these tokens before. Um, they essentially look like these ones right here. So they come over here and they uh, rest in the uh, chief engineer's kind of area. So essentially if those tokens happen to be in there, that's considered a hazardous section. Uh, sailors are allowed to move into and through them. Uh, but after finishing their movement, the, uh, you have to resolve crew damage for each sailor who had moved into or through the hazardous section. And essentially, from my understanding of that, is you're going to be going to this crew bag and you're going to be pulling a crew member out, and something bad is going to potentially happen. But I could be wrong. We might have to, I might have to double check the rules on that one. Um, but essentially, if something bad does happen to a crew.
remember, you typically go to that bag to see... I actually, no, sorry, that's more of a random element, uh, so that's my mistake. Uh, that's a mess up. Um, so after finishing movement, uh, after finishing movement, resolve crew damage for each sailor who has moved into or through a hazardous section. Uh, you want to resolve crew damage once for each environmental condition token per type per section. All sailors who have moved into or through a hazardous section during the current mobilization are affected simultaneously. All right, now ending mobilization. So once all the sailors have finished moving around after the captain gave its order to go ahead and do so and everyone's moving around like crazy uh, and resolve crew damage, if necessary, the captain must receive a verbal confirmation from each player. So basically you can just say, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, or, or if you want to be really thematic, you know, you, you can go all to town with that one. Uh, then it says, once all the players involved have conferred their readiness, the captain must announce the end of the current mobilization. Once that happens, no sailors can move until the captain announces the next mobilization. Of course, that would cause him to move his order token one more on the track. Now, the overall mobilization scheme is as follows. This is kind of the order of operations. You announce the mobilization, you move your sailors, you resolve crew damage, and you end it. Very straightforward. All right, let's set up a hypothetical situation here where the captain essentially wants to carry out an order or basically tell someone to carry out an order. So the captain's able to issue orders to other players. First off, the captain has to pay the order cost by advancing the order track by one space for each issue ordered. So if he goes ahead and decides from his orders list here that he wants to make sure to get the observers to watch their sectors, uh, first off, he'd want to ensure that there is actually a navigator in the required section. And that required section would be up on the bridge. Now, the only reason it'd have to be the navigator, and it doesn't always have to be, but the navigator specialize in observing. So if the navigator happens to be up there already, and the captain goes ahead and issues an order, he'd advance his order track up. If the navigator's already up there, that's great, because this individual specializes in that particular task, and because of that, it's only going to cost that particular individual that activated, or the group agreed that was going to activate, one token out of the three. So it basically is not using up as much energy to get that particular task done. Now, in a bad situation, let's say everybody's caught downstairs under the, or I shouldn't say downstairs, but inside the sub, there's fires, there's flooding, nobody can get anywhere. But let's say the chief engineer happens for some strange reason to be on the bridge, and he's the only guy that can check to see who's around. You can actually have the chief engineer do that um, observing on the bridge because he is in the required section, but because he's not specialized in that particular activity, uh, he's gonna actually have to spend two activation tokens to do the exact same job. So basically someone else can do it, but it's just a cost in terms of them not being able to specialize in it. Of course, it's gonna make them work longer and harder at it. Now, when you're actually carrying out orders in general, there's a, a sequence to follow that's advancing the order track and issuing the order, as I did with the captain, selecting the order in the app, so the first officer would be in charge of doing that, confirming whether the sailors are in position, that's just a general thing that the whole crew can do or the individuals involved can do, then launch the order in the app, so of course, first officer will push that through, activate the sailors, and then carry out the order. So we covered everything that would happen outside of the app, uh, but the first officer would also be tracking some of these things in the app, and we'll see that in the gameplay as well. Okay, a couple things I want to make note of in terms of activations. So a sailor with not enough empty uh, activation spaces cannot be activated until enough activation spaces are freed. So as of right now, you can see the chief engineer has his full three up to the line divider already filled up. So he wouldn't actually be able to be activated again until his activation pool becomes freed up. When placing a token in a sailor's activation space, you want to make sure that it's on the respective side of the panel that lines up with the particular crew panel. Because remember, don't accidentally put it up in this top section because when that watch changes, there is some balancing between the jobs happening based on the, that flip and that time flip. So you want to make sure that you're actually putting your activation tokens on the right side of the board for the particular watch that's actually um, kind of responsible at the current time. And of course, uh, if you ever run out of activation tokens, you can use any types of substitutes that you can find. However, this is a Kickstarter prototype, so it's likely that in the final version, there's going to be enough activation tokens to go around. Now, players remove activation tokens when their sailors rest. So that's how all these activation tokens would be removed. Sailors rest when the watch changes. So when a watch change happens every six hours, so at the sixth hour, the twelfth hour, the eighteenth hour, and of course, right back to zero again. 
So when that watch changes over, all these activation tokens would disappear. Now there are gonna be particular activations that we'll see in game as we go along that may carry over to another watch. So a job essentially that's being worked on by one of these individuals when the watch flips over to the opposite side may need to be moved to the other side of the board and continued with the other watch uh, because the job is ongoing past the hours that that particular watch happens to flip. Um, but in most normal cases, uh, in the case that I just showed you there where you had three activation tokens, the chief engineer was used up fully within the first, uh, within that six hour watch. And so when he flips over, the idea is that he's gone to sleep, he's rested. And so all his activation tokens are now removed. So one distinction I want to make in terms of the orders that a captain can actually give out is, as I mentioned before, crew mobilization, when an order is given on the order track here, for one, the, the full crew is allowed to move around the boat as they need to, um, but there's no need for them to actually put any activation tokens down for any crew members that have moved. However, if the captain orders anything else besides a crew mobilization, like any of these other options here on this particular player aid, then the actual corresponding crew members that do those particular actions have to actually place an activation token down in order to do them if they're specialized in them if they're not specialized in them it'll cost them an additional activation token on top of it so individuals that uh, need to do repairs for instance if they're not actually specialized in that this individual if he did a repair it would cost him two activation tokens to do it instead of the one from the chief engineer all right, let's cover the idea of busy sailors. So busy sailors essentially line up with a previous example I gave of the captain actually giving an order. And when he did so, he wanted those observers on the deck, which we actually happen to have the navigator up on top of the bridge right now, not the deck. And he actually is in that correct section with the correct um, specialization. So he's able to go ahead and do this. When this is occurring, instead of putting a normal activation token in his area, as I did in the example prior in this video, you'd actually be putting it up as a busy uh, a busy sailor and essentially what that means is basically he's up there observing and he's in this state constantly um, so essentially if a busy sailor is ever mobilized uh, so for instance if the captain at some point ever says all right time to do a crew mobilization let's up the orders everyone move around and this sailor happens to be one that moves around then essentially this uh, busy sailor is no longer busy and this would flip over to complete that activation now this sailor could go off and do whatever he wants now the only stipulation to that is if this particular sailor is actually um, ordered to do something in the same section that he's already currently busy, he doesn't need to flip this thing over. So in other words, a really good example of that, it wouldn't happen so, so much with the navigator, but this would really happen a lot with the engineers, I believe, because if there's malfunctions or problems within the ship and you've got one of these uh, uh, technical conditions, again, when we were going through the setup, the red, green, and yellow ones for different states of kind of things that are gone in disrepair. So if you're actually, if you've got yourself a full on failure, uh, then you've got, you know, this token sitting here denoting the chief engineer is working hard and is busy doing that. Um, but then it's, it's, if all of a sudden the captain goes ahead and orders more repairs, so the captain has a repair order, okay, so the captain puts it up again and orders the chief engineer to repair something else, this does not flip over as long as the chief engineer is making that repair in the same section where he's already busy. So in other words, it's only going to impact him if the uh, if it's a mobilization or something that draws him out of the current section he's in, then this token would flip over and then he would go about doing that repair or, or, or going about that mobilization that the captain has ordered. So hopefully that clears up a little bit or a little bit of understanding there about the busyness in terms of calling uh, an actual crew member busy. Now, if a busy sailor happens to actually die and can no longer participate in carrying out the order, update that information in the app as soon as possible. And that's going to be on the first officer to let that app know that that individual has been killed off. All right, up next is the watch changeover or the watch system inside of U-Boat. Now we wanna talk about this so you guys understand essentially how this works. We've got two individual crew members that are busy. This one's busy with a major failure. This one's busy with a regular failure. And we've got two activation tokens over here. Now, the way the game works, essentially when the watch changes over, this occurs on the six hour mark, the 12 hour mark, the 18 hour mark, and then again on the zero mark. So that's gonna be four watches every single day. Now, when this is ripping through like that, essentially what's happening is every single time the watch changes over, before the watch actually flips over, any you're allowed to remove uh, one activation token from every crew member. So in this particular case, these two would actually remove one token each. 
And again, that's all they do. Now, in the prior, prior earlier into this episode, I actually mentioned that uh, they would actually wipe all of their activation tokens, but that was not true. And I did double check that, that it's only just one coming off. With these individuals, they're considered busy, again, working on some major failures and regular failures. So what's going to happen essentially is the next crew that comes in to take over the watch is going to assume those duties. So these are going to actually transfer up into their activation area and they're going to continue the job. And again, it's the job of the first officer or the individual playing solo to update the app and let them know of that changeover in the progress of those repairs. Um, if the individual who takes over the current job does not have the specialization that's required for the task they're trying to complete, so for instance, if it's a, a mechanical repair um, and stuff like this, and the first officer was doing it, or the captain's crew was doing it, or the navigator crew was doing it, it actually costs an additional activation token alongside the busy token to continue that particular uh, endeavor Otherwise, it's kiboshed. So that's just something to take note of that, uh, again, where you want to make use of individuals that are proficient in certain tasks. If a sailor has a health condition and a required medical supplies have been placed on the health condition card, then discard one of the wound and fatigue tokens instead of an activation token. So we'll actually see this when we go through the gameplay. I'm not going to show this right now, but of course, if they have cards can actually be placed. Uh, and basically right now I have these player boards side by side, so there's no room for that. But I'm going to be spacing them out a bit so that you can actually put some cards in the areas up above and below if they get particular conditions that are health conditions. And essentially, if the required medical supplies are in place, then we discard wound and fatigue tokens instead of an activation token being removed. It's just something to keep in mind. So to close that out, changing the watch, the summary of that is resolving crew damage is number one. Next, you discard and or transfer activation tokens like I showed you there. And then we flip crew tiles. And there you go. We've got the watch summary down. Next up, we're going to cover health. So whenever a sailor becomes sick or is wounded, he's assigned a card. So cards causing these conditions are collectively referred to as health condition cards, and they can come from a number of different decks and places. So the event card, a morale card, or due to resolving crew damage. So let's say hypothetically that this was the event card that was pulled from the event deck of the first officer, and it says scurvy. So it says assign this card to a random sailor. If this card was pulled, we'd be going to the bag, which we set up in the solo setup right there, and it would be randomly placed on a particular sailor. Let's say hypothetically it landed on the first officer. You could then just slip this card underneath like this and all you really need to reference is either the top or the bottom portion of the card. The only reason that they have the top and the bottom is because it can be slid underneath the actual player board on purpose so you can easily denote which uh, from which watch this uh, you know this scurvy happens to pertain. So if it happened to be for the opposite side of the watch and the other side you could slide this up across the top here. Now of course when we do the playthrough I'll shift this down so there's space but this is a really nice reminder that this individual has scurvy even though that's not a friendly reminder. So the first thing you need to do is resolve the tokens or symbols that are on here. You have to put those on right away and you can remove activation tokens in order to put on all the other tokens that are listed here. Uh, so essentially in this particular case, it's saying to put on a wound token and an activation token. So in this case, we'd be putting on a wound token. There's no more room to put another activation token on. So it's discarded. We do not care about it anymore. What we need in order to get rid of it is these two medical supplies right here that to me look like food. So once we get those two pieces of food, then we can resolve that particular piece of it in terms of resolving his condition which we'll talk about later on. If a sailor receives a second wound token then he is dead and eliminated from the game. So if we were to get another card or some kind of a game effect that actually put another wound token on this individual then this would be placed right here. This individual would be considered dead and out of the game. If that happens to land like that then you go ahead and put a KIA token on the individual that's been killed off. You could wipe the rest of the things off of him. Um, but basically this KIA token will sit in the activation. Uh, you can put it in his activation spaces or up on his player area here, but regardless he's out and then you're going to go ahead and find his, his actual matching figure which is on the sub itself and you're going to knock it over on its side to say that he died in that particular location. The sailor is no longer part of the game and you stand the figure up uh, whenever the watch changes unless the counterpart from the other watch is uh, KIA as well. Uh, when sailors receive uh, KIA tokens, the captain must advance the morale track by two for each KIA or killed in action sailor. So this morale track is going to be going up. So that's going to be this guy right here. So this track is going to be continually moving up. And as you can see, there are certain pipes that connect up to so certain Roman numerals. And as these things go up the status up the track and they start going into dangerous territory, if you if the order is given. Uh, on, a, on a particular order that lines up with a pipe, a morale card needs to be drawn, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. 
Sadly, if any sailors are left, of course, on the bridge, if the sub happens to dive, they're automatically killed in action. That's kind of an obvious one. Don't leave individuals on top of the bridge when you dive or you are going to lose them. Uh, if, and of course it says wound and fatigue tokens remain in effect until they're treated. So they're always in effect until you get the medical supplies necessary to treat them. Uh, next up is repairs. So the submarine may suffer a variety of malfunctions and damage. It's always the chief engineer's responsibility to manage those repairs. So that's this guy right here. And of course, these are the different types of, of malfunctions and things like that that can happen. Again, denoted within the player aid, technical conditions of maintenance failure and major failure. Uh, so those are three different levels. Environmental conditions are all, like we talked about, the solo setup handled by the engineer as well. They directly influence the crew's health, morale, and performance. They are placed on the 3D model of the submarine and must be dealt with using appropriate supplies. Three of them, fire, electrical hazard, and toxic gas, cause sections to become hazardous and may require players to resolve crew damage when they move through them or move into them. Uh, we also have situations with hull breaches. So you don't want to see hull breaches in this game whatsoever. A breached hull is the most severe type of failure on a submarine. The integrity of the pressure hull has been compromised and the U-boat is taking on water. Each time a hull breach occurs, a countdown starts in the app and this is how much time the players have to seal the breach. Now there's a whole interesting dynamic to sealing the breach that all ends up coming down to this puzzle right here i believe we'll have to check that when we actually go through that particular situation but i believe there's a puzzle there you have to actually solve in a limited amount of time in order to seal up that particular breach uh, resolving crew damage so crew damage must be resolved when sailors become exposed to environmental conditions or enemy attacks like we've mentioned already in particularly crew damage is resolved when a fire electrical hazard or toxic gas condition token is placed in a section where one or more sailors are located. The sections containing one or more of these tokens are referred to as hazardous sections, as we mentioned before. One or more sailors move into or through it is you know, considered in a hazardous section. Uh, if one or more sailors are located in a hazardous section when a, when a watch changeover begins, that's also bad. The app instructs the players to resolve crew damage as a result of an enemy attack that's also resolving of another crew damage. So all those things uh, fall into the crew damage bucket. Now crew damage is resolved like this. The captain draws as many crew tokens as there are sailors in the affected station. So it is going to still um, be pulled from the bag. If any token drawn match any of the sailors in that section, the first officer assigns a wound card of the indicated type to each of those sailors. Fire causes burns, electrical hazards cause electric shock, toxic gas causes poisoning. Assign wound cards to sailors one by one in the order of your choice and do not reveal a wound card before choosing which sailor to assign it to. If there are multiple environmental conditions tokens of various kinds in a section, then resolve crew damage caused by them one token at a time in the order of your choice. If there are multiple uh, environmental condition tokens of the same kind in a section, then multiply the number of crew tokens drawn by the number of environmental condition tokens and uh, and move on from there. So that like that's a whole that's kind of a situational thing. We'll see that in the playthrough if it happens to occur, but at the end of the day, if you happen to have these environmental conditions happening, which again are all noted here on the mechanics player aid here, you can see these are all the types of things that can happen that are non-hazardous ones, but the ones that are hazardous are the bad ones, the ones that are going to affect us. If those particular things happen, we happen to be in them, moved into them, and stuff like this, um, as we mentioned the, um, just a few seconds ago, then we're going to be having to pull from the bag, the cabin's going to pull random sailors, and if they match the individual that's in that room, they're going to be wounded, which is not good. And if you're wounded, you're going to be pulling from the wound deck, which is right here. And this is going to be giving you some nasty surprises. Now, in the result of timing con conflicts, because this game is a real-time game, that is going to emerge at certain times where you're in the middle of doing multiple things at once. Remember the golden rule. Always finish carrying out one order and resolving one game effect before moving on to the next. So, in other words, don't get yourself trapped into a situation where you're resolving multiple actions between four different roles and you've lost what the order of operations is in terms of what you're doing. You'll get yourself confused. It's much easier to just complete fully the action that you're actually Actually doing regardless of the app's real-time effect on what's going on you'll just resolve as you can during the app the other thing you can do if you find that you're getting into a situation where you're uh, unable to catch up or there's too much happening uh, you can potentially uh, jump out of the app without exiting it or if you're on iOS for instance like swiping up and closing it you can actually just kind of go back to the home page and the game should automatically pause now I don't know if the final version of this particular app will have a pause button in it but I am 
imagine it will, uh, and that will likely allow you to pause the game in those situations, especially for solo players when there's a lot going on and you need some time to just kind of get things back in order. But being that it's a real-time game, I don't know if I expect something like that. That could be, uh, you know, something that just doesn't ever get added into this game because that's just not the way it's meant to be played. Um, so I can't speak to whether that will or won't be, but I know that one trick or tip I have would be to just jump out of the app and it should pause it, but uh, I'm gonna be testing that as well when I do the playthrough of the prototype, but can't say in the final version whether that functionality will come across and work like that or not. All right, let's talk a little bit about this morale track that the captain has to handle during this adventure. So basically at the very top here you have the order track and I've referred to it as this. What's below here is called the morale track. Let's talk about them individually as well as what's going on here with the easy, medium, and hard. Now in the setup, we set ourselves up for easy. On the order chart or order track going along the top here, we have including the black empty space where your token rests and starts. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven actual orders that can be given um, before if you're playing on hard, you have to stop. This token, depending on which difficulty level you choose, actually gives you additional actual orders along the order track. So you're playing on easy, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine orders that I can go until I have to start using the morale track. If I'm playing on hard, that occurs much sooner in the game. So that's the difference there, and that's why I'm playing on easy. Once you head into the morale track, that can't be, um, that doesn't get reset. So in other words, the only thing that gets reset is, for instance, if you're on your very first watch, so your very first six hour shift, and you've got this thing all the way to here, and this is as far as, it, it, as you went, and you were playing on easy, and you're, you know, you're somewhere in here, you're fine because you never went down to the morale because you never went all the way to the end and you flip your watch over and you change your watch, this gets reset back to zero and you're fine. So as long as you can keep your order track using it all the time and not hit morale, you're golden. The problem is in situations in this game will push you into the morale area because of situations that you don't expect or, or weren't prepared for. So in those cases, if you're on a watch for six hours and you actually had pushed your order track all the way up to the very end on the easy section, so you're, you're all the way up until you're butting right up against the other token, which is the easy one, then you're done your order track. And if you want to issue any more orders, you have to go down the morale one. And as soon as you move that morale token one and it hits a pipe that connects to a card, you have to pick up that particular card and resolve it. Now, the other thing too is when this, that six hour watch, if this six hour watch hit right now, we were supposed to flip it again, this would get reset back down, but the morale track sits exactly where it still stands. So in other words, this morale track constantly gets worse and worse as the game goes on if you're not handling it and managing it correctly. There are things that the captain has at his disposal. So for instance, he can give the uh, crew some chocolate and if he does this, he can retract the morale track by two. So in that particular case, you know, he could be halfway through a watch and he could have his morale track up here and he could say, you know what, I'm gonna give everyone chocolate and bam, his morale track's back to zero again, which is perfect. And the likelihood of getting hit on something here is less. Now you can see it seems to hit a card almost every second one up the track. Of course, if you end up going all in a single six hour shift, if you have your orders all the way up to here and then you use all and your morale track is all the way to the very last spot, and the game requires you to take one more order or you have to, then you essentially are surrendering your sub and the allies have captured you. All right, let's talk a little bit about the navigator and cover off what's important for the navigator to know. Now, the navigator is gonna be handling things like the food, essentially. So today's meal is gonna have the food supply. We'll talk about that in a second, but essentially that's gonna help boost morale. You're gonna to want to eat. If you're not eating and the crew's not eating, uh, then essentially morale is gonna go down. So preparing food is an important part of the navigator's job. Along with tracking the sub's position when enemies are actually found, when they're found, you start marking it on this particular uh, grid here and you'll be able to actually mark out how many, you know, distance wise, how far away from them you are, roughly what your angle is to them and that type of thing. This will be talked about later. Uh, but this is what I wanna talk about right now, which is the overarching map of where you currently are uh, in relation to the waters around England for the time period of this particular game, which is World War II. So essentially, you've got a map here based in that particular time frame. It's all broken into different sections like AE, AF, and all this kind of stuff, AN and AM. 
And the app essentially, when you start your mission, is going to automatically tell you which quadrant you're starting in, which section, and then which quadrant. So you'll know exactly where you're going to start in. So let's say hypothetically the app told us we were in AF76, which we put a dot right here, you know, and then it, it, we did, we asked the captain. Of course, we're not asking the captain when we're playing solo. We would be actually just making that choice, which is great. So I could sit there and say, oh, the app told us that we're in 76. Well, I really want to kind of cut right through those two islands there and see what's kind of going on over here. So let's try to head over to 32 and stuff like that, then you just simply take your ruler and you'd find your 32 in the middle and your 76 and you would draw yourself a nice line between them, hopefully as straight as possible. Of course, because I'm doing this one-handed, it probably won't be that nice. Oh, that actually turned out pretty good. So now you got yourself like a, a line going from grid to grid. Next thing you're gonna do is grab your 360 protractor. You're gonna line up your point in the middle of that protractor. Of course, this is all gonna change with the uh, content of the Kickstarter will likely be a wooden one be really fancy looking this one's just a, a plastic one but you're gonna basically line this up right in the center make sure it's uh, exactly going north to south correctly so zero is up top of course you're gonna go around and you're counting and th on this particular 360 protractor you're counting the numbers on the bottom so you're going all the way around until you see your line and I would say that that's probably sitting at about 243 so we'd say 243 degrees is the direction that we're actually headed in. And so you'd actually let the first officer know that that's the, the direction that would get inputted into the app and you're good to go. The other thing to keep in mind is the range ruler. The range ruler is a really cool tool. And again, it will be a wooden one in the Kickstarter, I think. Uh, of course, that's subject to change as well. This one here shows the surface, a full speed ahead distance covered in hours. So you can always use this to actually determine, okay, if we went from these two locations, how long would it take? you know and stuff like this in hours and now you know so for essentially if you were surfaced and you were going full speed ahead so you come over here and you're at full speed ahead essentially on the engines uh, that you would make it from quadrant 76 all the way down over here in about one two three four five six hour oh no sorry i guess the hours are right here so that'd be 18 hours so it'd be three six nine yeah that'd be 18 hours so that would end up being three full watches before you finally reached your destination now if you decided to actually submerge your sub uh, then the distance covered like uh, would change and I don't really know what goes on with the submerged one on this particular prototype is it doesn't really uh, you know fully go across everything but it looks like each one goes up by four uh, actually that's not even true this is 6 to 12 to 18 so that doesn't really make too much sense to me so I'm not too sure how practical that is on, on the prototype side of things again I think in the final version the idea is that this is going to be increasing um, exponentially I guess and will actually be shown here I shouldn't say exponentially but it, all the numbers will be straight across the back of it but it's just a handy tool to have you may or may not use it it's a good guide to give you an idea as to how far you've traveled but the app is also going to give you some of that feedback as well so in addition to plotting the course that the navigator can do here in this kind of overland or overworld map here of the waters around England, you can also actually use the sextant in order to plot the U-boat's accurate position. So for instance, if you've been plotting for quite some time and you're a little unsure that you've been doing things correctly, you can actually have an individual who's sitting on the bridge actually go ahead. The order has to be carried out on this bridge. It has to be. And you can activate the sailor carrying out the order as normal. So you have to use activation tokens as normal. And then you'd ask the first officer in solo play that would be yourself You just check the instruments menu inside the app and it would give you the exact uh, Correct coordinates of where you currently are located where your sub currently sits All right now that we've talked a little bit about this overview map and plotting points in terms of where the sub is going to start and where it's headed Let's just actually erase this example and talk a little bit about the attack disc I'm going to show you exactly how this works on the attack disc in terms of when you find your first contact. So let's say hypothetically, we've got a um, observer or a navigator up on top of the bridge. He's pinpointed a particular ship. The first officer in the app is going to let you know that a particular information is coming through about the uh, contact that the first officer has found. Um, we're gonna say, for instance, that the U-boat in this particular situation is following a course of 290. So it's not following the 243 that we did here, but that's just because I wanna do this particular example here so we're gonna go ahead with 290 so again you get your attack disc right now everything is centered straight up the middle to zero which is a good way to start I guess and then after that you can move things as you want the first thing you're gonna do here is you know that you as the u-boat which is this one right here the green disc is at 290 we'll move this to 290 in a second but first let's do the contact that we just found 
So the contact that we just found is actually uh, at a course of 70 degrees. So we're gonna flip this black thing around and this black dial all the way around to 70 and now it's lined up. So this is our contacts course. Our U-boats course was going at 290. So we're gonna flip this back kind of the opposite way and we'll find 290. And this is gonna give us a good idea of where we are in relation to them. The next thing that matters is the bearing itself. So the bearing here said that we were bearing at about and we can actually flip this around so now that we're pointing towards the u-boats course because this is what really matters so right now this u-boat my our u-boat course is heading at 290 so basically we have an enemy that's basically uh, a con we have a contact of an enemy heading in this direction but the bearing has been given to us at 40 now you'll notice on the bearing is right here on on the same green disc as the u-boat you use this black arrow to point to that 40 and now what it's going to do is it's going to be telling us that the contact is moving this way and we're going this way but they're bearing right here so in other words this is the direction four miles away from us so if you want to actually plot that out on this map we're going to come up here and we're going to go ahead and put our u-boat down we'll put it right in the center so each one of these represents um one uh, I think if I remember correctly, these ones re represent each a mile. So this is going to be sitting straight here in the middle, and we know that it's a distance of four miles away. We know that our contact is heading 70 degrees, so the orientation of his ship is going to be like this. He's heading in this direction. But according to, in relation to our sub, he's actually up here somewhere because he's bearing 40 degrees from us. So he's actually one, two, three. Four. He's sitting somewhere up here like this. So this is how the navigator could plot essentially the course just by getting the bearing, the distance, and the course in relation to where the sub currently is. And there you go, in a, a split second, you already know uh, kind of what angle you're going in. And the cool thing about it is now you know this uh, this particular ship that you're looking at is heading this, this particular angle. And you know that if you want to make a really good uh, broadside attack on it, all you have to do, because the U-boat course is right here has a firing angle arc you can actually see how many degrees you need to turn before you can actually make a broadside attack on that particular boat which is the best chance for taking it out other than the navigation itself the navigator also manages the crew's food consumption good food fosters good morale and neglecting this aspect and morale will quickly suffer afterwards a good meal will consist of three different ingredients, which is represented by a bunch of different provision tokens, which we can find in the food supply area right here. They're all face down for now the way they should be. You shouldn't be able to see them. They consist of things like onions, bread, lemons, eggs, tin fish, meat, and potatoes. They make a number of different combinations that the navigator can take a look at in order to see what he can make. And again, a three product meal is what he's going for as it will give a morale track negative uh, one, which means it will reduce on the negative track, which is what you want. It's the best meal you can make. Two is no effect, and then one and lower is all bad. The morale track increases as people get more and more frustrated, either they're unhappy because of the food quality or they're just unhappy because nothing exciting in terms of food is being created um, and stuff like that. So you're always wanting to try to aim for things like casserole stew and potato pancakes as the best things you can put together. So how do you do this? Well, what ends up happening to prepare a meal, the sailor with the meal preparation icon, which you can see this observer has one right here, has to be in the cruise quarters, which lines up with this icon right here. As long as he's in there, the captain can actually give the order. So again, this would go on the order track in order to prepare a meal. So you can see there's a prepare meal order. If he does this, then at that particular time, then the uh, navigator is able to draw tokens one by one from this particular food supply in order to populate this available products triangle or uh, yeah, triangle. So essentially, we're just going to grab a token at a time and flip them over, and populate all the different uh, all the different uh, locations of things that we can potentially make. So what ends up happening here is. Before you select the tokens, the navigator may switch positions of any two tokens or discard any one token and draw a new one from the food supply to replace it. The only reason you want to do that is for combination purposes and so you may want to switch them around. The reason for that I'll explain in a second. If you choose to do that, it's going to cost you an additional activation to do so and that's going to be have to be that's going to actually be put on the individual doing it. So in this case, it would be right here. Um, and you'll be activating the sailor. 
Uh, the meal consists of one, two, or three tokens, as I mentioned before. If the navigator selects more than one token, they must be adjacent to one another. So that's the biggest thing. Adjacency can be attract can be tracked in all directions. So in other words, if I want the potato and it, uh, sorry, if I want the onions, I have to take the potato, or I guess it depends on what you're making essentially. But adjacency normally is just whatever is beside it in any direction. Uh, but you have to take things in, in groups. Think of it that way. So essentially, if I want that potato and I want that potato. Potato, I have to take things that kind of go in between it as well. So essentially I'm looking at my product combinations here and actually it looks like we may have enough right here in the bottom for potato pancakes I think. So that's the potato, the eggs, and I believe that's onions. So that would be these three right here. So I could take these three. Now the other thing too is there's a rule in here that says that if you use any lemons whatsoever they and they're adjacent they have to be combined into the meal as well. Um, and so if that is the case, just make sure that you pull that particular uh, lemon in and then you collect all the selected tokens and you put them in the today's meal section space of the navigators uh, panel. And then you inform the first officer, but of course you're playing solo and the captain that the crew has been fed, replenish the available products pyramid with new provision tokens drawn from the food supply. So then these things would go away and new you know, provisions would come throughout and then you could potentially attempt at making a different meal when you're ordered to do so, but at least you'd know in advance the types of ingredients you can use. So that's essentially getting your meals to the tables for the crew. One thing to note is if there happens to be a lemon token in the available product section, like there was in the last example, it has to be grouped in with the today's meal regardless of adjacency. So it could be on the other side of the pyramid. You could only be taking two products. If this happens to be a lemon, it goes in with it. Just something to keep note of. All right, let's switch over to the chief engineer or the engineer. This chief engineer's responsibility on the sub is to operate and maintain the U-boat's propulsion and ballast systems. They also play a key role in repairing all technical and environmental conditions as well as hull breaches. So those breaches are gonna be solved by this puzzle up here in the top right. Now generally when the U-boat is surfaced, it runs on diesel engines and charges the electric motor's batteries while it's running on those diesel engines. When the U-boat is submerged under water, it runs on electric motors and draws from the batteries at that particular time. This is the norm. Uh, each time the submarine dives or surfaces, the chief engineer has to switch is to switch propulsion, of course. It requires one sailor in the engine room and one in the aft section. So the aft section and engine room can be found at the back of the sub. So you're gonna have to have individuals in both of those places. Uh, to change speed, the engines need two sailors in either the aft section or the engine room. And of course, this is all dependent on whether you're talking about diesel versus batteries. If you're talking diesel, you need to be in the engine room. And if you're talking about the batteries, you need to be in the aft section. Uh, but regardless, those are the two areas you need to be in in order to have a change of speed occur. If you, you also wanna make sure to update the engine room telegraph on the chief engineer's uh, player panel, which is right here. So as you go up the changing of speed, you want to be bumping these things up and keeping track of them on those particular gauges there. Uh, next up is all about the different types of conditions that the engineer has to handle. Next up, let's talk about the environmental conditions and technical conditions that the chief engineer is responsible for. So that's going to be technical wise, we're talking maintenance, which is the green uh, wrench right here. Uh, the yellow wrench is failure and the red one is major failure. So when these particular technical conditions occur, we immediately, depending on who's responsible to actually be repairing them, need to assign them to a particular sailor who's actually doing the particular job. So if a first officer reports a technical condition, the chief engineer must immediately mark it with the appropriate token. Each technical condition has a difficulty level, shown by the color we've already talked about. Severity affects the number of sailors required to repair it, so the app will let us know how many people we need to have on the job to repair that particular condition. When sailors are ordered to repair one, they are considered busy, as we talked about prior in this episode. The app will indicate when repairs are finished, so the app will actually keep a progress of those repairs as it goes along. And of course, this could change based on the watch, like we talked about before. It could go over to the next watch after six hours. If the number of sailors on the repair crew changes, pause the repair in the app as soon as possible and update the number of sailors. So 
That's just the general idea of repairing technical conditions. All right, environmental conditions uh, that the chief engineer are responsible for. So when any of these particular environmental conditions occur, which there's a whole bunch of things over here like lighting failures and leaks and electrical failures and fires and all that good stuff. When any of those things happen on the ship, these conditions directly influence the crew's health, their morale and overall performance. They are marked on the 3D model and must be dealt with using appropriate supplies. So again, you use these tokens to mark where on the 3D model these potential events are occurring, or not potential, but these events are actually occurring. And then you use these uh, supplies uh, from the toolboxes that the chief engineer has at his disposal, uh, which is like wires, absorbers, water pumps, light bulbs, and fire extinguisher in order to satisfy those particular problems. So you're basically going to be using those individuals to bring toolboxes to different sides of the ship to resolve those particular problems. And that's essentially how you handle environmental conditions. In addition to the environmental conditions, any sailor moving through or from a section containing a toolbox can pick it up, as I mentioned before, to bring it into the section they need it. The repair difficulty of all the environmental conditions is just one. So you just activate the sailor carrying out the order with a regular activation token. You do not have to use the app in order to track this. The captain pays the order cost as normal and the sailor carrying out repairs is activated with a regular activation token. The officer controlling that sailor moves the environmental condition token. Um, and then, of course, having the right supplies does not protect a sailor against the effects of fire or electrical failure. So it doesn't matter if you have those particular uh, things in the toolbox with you, you still can be hurt by those things uh, and things like that. And that, of course, falls into the hazardous section, which is like electrical failures and fires and toxic gas. Uh, those three are hazardous. Non-hazardous are like lighting failures and leaks. Those things are not going to hurt you when you're in that particular area. Um, but the other ones can actually potentially hurt you by being in them or moving through them. All right, let's quickly talk about hull breaches in U-boat. This gets a little bit crazy. So what you're seeing here in front of you essentially is a puzzle which has all been put together from the back of the ship or the aft of the ship all the way up to the bow section. So basically the full run of the ship. Now in this particular puzzle, there has been two additional pieces added on that essentially really aren't part of the actual ship itself. But essentially when a hull breach occurs, it starts a countdown in the app and the countdown shows the remaining time the players have to seal the breach. Players have to assemble three adjacent sections of the puzzle. These sections are where the hull breach occurred. And these sections are either in the forward or aft. So the bow and aft sections, as I mentioned, have the extra pieces on the end or extra two, just to kind of like give it a little bit of extra flair when you're putting the puzzle together. But essentially, if it's in the... Um uh, if you were actually going after the bow section, for instance, uh, then you'd be coming over here and you'd be trying your best to get these three particular ones together. And if you got these three complete before the timer runs out in the app and everyone's able to do this, the first officer is supposed to grab this, put it out and play and everyone's supposed to do it. But on a solo play, you're trying to do it. If you can assemble this before the timer runs out in the app, then you successfully sealed off uh, the uh, the breach and once the puzzle solved you select the yes button in the app the timer stops if the players fail to complete the puzzle or the individual fails to in a solo play uh, then all sailors that remain in the section where the hull breach happened are considered killed in action put a flooded section token in the section where the hull breach occurred sailors can never move into or through a flooded section and that's where things get dicey as things get sectioned off in the sub because of the floods um, sections that have not been cut off though are not flooded and may be used as normal so people might be kind of stuck in certain sections. Um, after resolving the hull breach collect several pieces and shuffle them all up because you might have another one coming at you real soon. Now that's just a really high level look at everything so hopefully this video gives you a good idea of the general rules overview of everything. The only thing I didn't show you in this one so far is the app. And the app, I think I'm going to be showing you as I do a little bit of a playthrough demonstration. Uh, the playthrough demonstration may be a little bit different than what you're used to in terms of what I normally do, where it's uh, you know, it's typically real time all the time. I may have to cut and take different edits and things like that as I go along because I'm handling this all solo. Um, but I'm going to tr try my best here to show this to you. And uh, I really hope you're as excited as I am to get into this. I am cannot wait to hit the sea and find out what we can find in terms of allied boats and try to take them down. And uh, We'll see how long we last. I don't know. It might turn into a bloody disaster real quick, but uh, I'll do my best. So hope to see you in the upcoming playthrough when that gets going. And I'm not too sure on the time frame of that, so it may not be immediately. Uh, it might be a little bit, but uh, regardless, it's on its way. So hope you're excited. Give me a thumbs up if you want to see more. Thanks again for watching, and as always, keep on rolling solo.